and we are recording, so. All right, so hello, museum families, and welcome back to RBCM at Home Kid. Actually, I said welcome back. I'm, I'm kind of welcoming myself back because I was on vacation last week. Um, but if you have been away, and or actually there are some people that have been away also, and they're, they're back, so welcome back, anyone who's coming back. So welcome to RBCM at Home Kids a play date through screens across British Columbia and the world. The previous sessions are recorded and you can find them on our Royal BC Museum YouTube page. My name is Chris O'Connor and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum and my home is on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, Songhees and Esquimalt nations here in Victoria on Vancouver Island. I'm an uninvited guest on this territory and grateful to live, learn and raise a family on this land. So summer is just about over, unfortunately, and we are about to head into fall, which is one of my favorite seasons, in part because I love seeing the changing color of leaves um, on trees and those leaves slowly falling away, making for some great piles of leaves to jump in, which is one of my favorite things to do. But what are those leaves? How are, we, how are they different from each other? What tree do they come from? How do we make sense of all the different kinds of leaves that we see? And what do they tell us about the world that we live in? So that's what we're gonna be exploring today. Um, but before that, or like we usually do, we're just gonna um, look back to last week with RBCM at Home Kids. So again, I wasn't here last week, um, but Kim was the host and uh, the guest was Mitra Niku. Um, and the, the picture that you're seeing on the right is the picture that Mitra finished. She was working on this one of a shell um, doing science illustration. And then two of our participants submitted uh, the shells that they were working on too. So beautiful, um, really like lots of great close looking understanding what we're looking at through, through sketching and drawing. So that was last week. Not gonna uh, make art necessarily today, but we might do some drawing. Um, so if you, whatever you wanna share today, even if it's a drawing of the leaves that you categorize, uh, definitely feel free to share it with us, with me. Um, C-O-C-O-N-N-O-R at royalbcmuseum.bc.ca or share it through our social feeds uh, at Royal BC Museum or hashtag RBCM Kids. As always, continue exploring after our online programs through our learning portal. Um, Ken actually has uh, some things up on the learning portal as well. So uh, if you're in Tree, continue exploring. You can Google learning portal and Royal BC Museum. And next week, it's a little bit of a surprise. So uh, usually I tell you what's gonna be next week, but it's a little bit of a surprise. But um, what I will say is it has to do with um, school and school starting. And it's a, uh, with a beautiful family uh, that is connected with the, the, the museum and who does really incredible work around learning. Um, so that will be next week, next Wednesday. All right, so. Let's come back to, so just a reminder, this is a, a webinar, so you can see us, but we can't see you, but we can connect with you if, um, if you use the Q&A box or the comments section on, on, in Zoom, if you're on Zoom, or the comments section if you're on Facebook Live. And a heads up, we'll be investigating leaves today, so if you would like, you can gather an assortment of leaves, about 20 in total, um, and they should be different a variety of different kinds of leaves. And then also paper and something to draw with, also only if you'd like. But, um, but if you don't have these things, not a problem. You could watch this now and then again later when you do have them. So let's meet our special guest for today. Um, today we have Dr. Ken Mark. And Ken is the curator of botany here at the Royal BC Museum, which means that he knows a lot about plants and trees. And he helps look after them and grow the collection of hundreds of thousands of plant specimens that we have here in our Royal BC Museum herbarium. So um, welcome, Ken. I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you, Chris. This is a, a fun activity that I've done with groups before. And um, 
We're, this is the first time I've tried to do this uh, in this manner, but um, when we're finished, you and some of your friends might want to get together and you can all get a group of leaves and uh, all of you get the same leaves and then uh, work apart from each other and see if you create groups in the same way. So in other words, to restate that, each group has identical set of leaves, each person or a group of people. And then you, on your own, you just kind of organize them the way that you think makes the most sense. And, and the goal being to uh, put leaves together that have something in common with each other and are more common to each other than they are to another group of leaves. So today we're going to do it in a little different manner. So Ken, before that, can I ask just, because you're a curator at the museum. Yeah. Why is organizing important? Yeah, and, and that's a kind of a question I put in the, um, in the introduction to this session this morning. And I wonder, is anyone, I'll, I can give my answer, but uh, would anyone else like to give an answer? Like, why do we, not only leave, but throughout our lives, why do we organize and give names to different objects? What's important about that? Or is it important? I'll just wait a couple of seconds and, and uh, while you're thinking about that, um, if I told you about a plant called poison hemlock, would you go out and, and add it to your lettuce and tomatoes and cucumbers for a salad? Um, I'm gonna say no. That would be a good answer, Chris, because poison hemlock actually is a common weed around Victoria as well as much of Western North America. And if you ate it too much, you could uh, die from it. So, yeah, I see so one. Ken, I just, um, Hartley uh, says, like, we can get different plants confused. Yeah, so, so it's good question, Hartley. So it's really important to be able to communicate. Um, some, some names often have meaning in them. The name of a plant has some meaning, just like the one I gave a poison hemlock. So um, you might want to know, okay, what plants looks like poison hemlock? And maybe the plants that look like poison hemlock would also be poisonous. So that's one of the reasons why we like to group plants together. We'll just use plants today and we'll use leaves of plants today. But one of the reasons we want to group them together is some kind of logical order that helps us understand a bigger picture about diversity. So I'm going to switch to my camera and um, we'll see if this works and bear with us if it doesn't work very well. It so works. You, it works, okay, hooray. So I'm a low tech kind of guy, so this is a major accomplishment. Okay, so now can I can see my be, leaves. Can just before you also you start in on that, just we yeah. can hear you so you can speak, but when did you first start getting interested in um, plants and and trees. I, I am very fortunate. There are a lot of kids out there who are, um, might be interested in like, where, when did you start, when did your passion for this begin? So this passion began when I was very young because both my parents were scientists and both of my father in particular was a biologist, a, a botanist, a plant ecologist to be specific. And uh, so I just grew up listening to my parents talk about plants and how important they were in the environment for animals, for people, for um, everything else that lives around us. So um, yeah, for me, it was kind of unusual. Mm. Yeah, and, but I, uh, and I also went on field trips with my father and, and I love to be outside. And so what could be better than being with your dad outside and looking at plants? And he was very patient with me. Uh, if I asked him the name of a plant and he told me and I forgot it right away, he'd tell me again. Mm. I never got impatient with me and, and said that I, uh, had a poor memory. <laughs> so, yeah, and I found actually I had a pretty good memory for remembering the names of plants. So before we can put a name on a particular plant, often we put them into larger categories, larger groups. Mm -hmm. So I'm, these are a few plants that I collected uh, around my yard this morning. And I don't know, Liz, is there a way to focus this? Yes. Right here? Yep. On the black knob on, on the end? black knob. Yep. Oh, oh here. Yeah. There you will go. I can zoom, but can I focus? Yep. How's that look? That's kind of fuzzy, isn't it? It might be because we have it lifted up. Yeah, but we'll, we'll just work with that. <laughs> okay, so um, if you have a set of leaves yourselves, you can sort of start doing this your, yourself. And there's no correct answer. So the, I'm just looking at 
First thing I'm kind of looking at is the shape of the leaves. And what uh, would you guys think if you're looking at my leaves or if you're looking at your own set of leaves, what, what features would you start to, uh, let's just say we're gonna break, uh, we're gonna create two groups here. What, what would be a good way to, to uh, divide these groups? And again, people can write in the comment section on Facebook Live or the chat. So I'm just gonna start with two groups here. Is there anything that jumps out at you? So I'm, first of all, I seem to, it seems like I'm looking at shape and I'm moving these leaves around because I'm trying to get them all into the image. Um, smooth and curly, okay, that's one approach. Long leaves and wide leaves, that's another one. Narrow leaves and wide leaves, okay. And I would say like multiple leaves on yeah, and a single leaves. Leaves. Oh, right. Single leaves or divided leaves. Yeah, so we call these, and I, that's kind of the same direction I go, Chris. Is um, I'm going to go with my first big category is going to be leaves that have several parts to them. So I'm kind of separating these out, and. I won't go into too much terminology, but each one of these tiny little divisions is actually a leaflet. So this is an entire single leaf. And I like Chris's idea of um, looking at the overall shape and going with those that are divided versus those that are not divided into smaller parts. So what other ideas? Now I've got two groups. So um, Ken, just to, just to um, jump in here. So sure. partly says mine have all one part. So ah. that, would, that gives a different kind of challenge. So that maybe does it's, give a, yeah. Maybe it's like one that's waxy and one that's not waxy or that you know anything that makes sense to you is a, is a good way to start. And partly afterwards uh, you might go outside and see if you can find some leaves that look like these with smaller divisions. Hmm. Um yeah, so and as I'm doing this now, I'm turning over the leaves and I can see some have, you know, really um, distinct pattern of veins, the veins in the leaves. Um, so I'm thinking about that. And I can see the pattern of this veins are, are really interesting. Now here, I'm just looking at this leaf here and the veins all kind of come from one point. Now, can everyone see can this? Can you bring it closer to the camera? Yeah. So the veins are all coming from one point as compared to these, which are coming from a lot of, um, a whole extension of the axis of the leaf. Um, so I, I could think about that, but I, I've kind of decided right now, I'm just going to make two groups out of this set here. Um, so what else I'm looking at is I'm kind of looking at the margin of the leaf, the edges of the leaf. And if you look at the edges of the leaves I have here, what do you see? Like I'm seeing um, some of them have teeth along the margins like this and some of them are smooth. I don't know how well does that show? Smooth margins and tooth margins. Um, and someone said shiny. I mean I have a, a shiny leaf here also. Um, I stole this from my daughter's jade plant this morning, and it's really thick also. And a thick leaf like this probably stores a lot of water, so I would suspect this plant's adapted for growing in a very dry environment. Um, so I, I, and then I'm looking at this leaf here, which is really fuzzy. I don't know if that shows up. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by creating two groups one group with smooth leaf margins. Oh, and here's a real small one. And another group with 
rough leaf margins. Here's another smooth one. Um, Would a botanist use the term monology serrated or? Oh, Chris, excellent word. A botanist would use the word serrated. Yep, serrated leaf margins and uh, serrated simply means toothed. The teeth can be um, really sharp or they can be really um, rounded. So those are two different sets of terminology. And, and that is one of the things that um, um, scientists use a lot of terminology in order to communicate information. And I'm gonna now, I'm gonna go back to this group here. So now you have three groups. Now I have three groups. It's a little bit hard to see the divisions perhaps. I'll see if I can separate them out more. Um, does anyone have any suggestions? So I've got this group of four leaves here. How should I make two groups out of those four? So again, feel free to write in the chat or in the comment section or Facebook Live. For the three, the four, four leaves, the leaves the left, here. Yeah. What, what would be the distinguishing feature that would make them into two groups? Hmm. Put on our thinking caps. So I'll tell you what I would do. I'm just looking again, you know, this leaf is kind of divided. Kind of all coming from one point, almost like the palm of my hand, which looks very red under this light. Um, and there's actually a word for this is that, um, this leaf is palmately divided. So I'm gonna separate this leaf from these other three. And the, the terminology for here is called pinnately divided. Pinna or pinnate means leaf-like, or feather-like. So now I've got a, a one group of leaves. This one group is a, only has one member. It's a lonely leaf. And it's palmately divided leaf. And these are pinnately divided leaves. So now I, I, and I was going to say, Ken, sorry, just um, yeah. Hartley, Hartley writes another way possibly is few leaves and many leaves. Yeah. And maybe Good. that one that's that one that's in the center there on the left could possibly be s separated out from the other. Three. So we could we could put it here. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, as, we, as we said in the description, um, for this exercise, there's no necessarily right way to do this. If you do do this with a group of people and working independently from each other, see if you come up with the same organization of leaves. And my guess is you will not come up with the same organization. And then you can have a discussion among yourselves as to uh, what is the basis of your classification system. So as we're looking at leaves here, um, what, why are leaves important? So we've talked a little bit about classification and using these leaves as an example of a classification, but let's broaden it just a little bit. Why are leaves important? What do they do for a plant? So what do leaves do for the plant? What do leaves do for the plant, yeah. Like if the plant did not have the leaves, it, how, would, how would it impact? Like could what the would, plant grow without leaves? That's, a, yeah. that's another way to put it. So Hartley says, do they absorb sunlight? Yes, Hartley, they do absorb sunlight. And can anyone follow up on why that's important? Why would plants need sunlight? So I'll just go briefly, and, and I realize we're not here to talk about photosynthesis, but the most important <laughs> chemical but, reaction but on the response Earth, actually was sun makes all plants grow. Sun makes all plants grow by a process called photosynthesis that you'll learn about as you get into uh, middle school and high school. It's the most important chemical reaction on the planet. It's what gives plants their food and everything that eats plants gets their food ultimately from photosynthesis. And photosynthesis happens in the green parts of the leaves. So uh, incredibly important that plants have leaves. 
So backing up to our classification right now. Um, so we've, we're only looking at leaves now. And let's say you wanted to make sure that your classification scheme was really accurate. What more would you want to know about these plants that would help you group them together in a way that you knew where all the members of one group were closely related to each other? And that's what we mean about accuracy. So you only have, we're only looking at the leaves now. Um, and what else would you like to know about these plants? If you wanted me to bring in more information about these plants that the leaves came from, what else would you like to know? Um, Ken, just jumping in, there's a comment from Anna from Facebook. Yeah. Uh, talking about her seven-year-old son who said, without leaves, there would be no oxygen. That is a great answer. Mm -hmm. So, so now you're asking, so what, what more might we want to investigate about these leaves in order to classify them further? Yeah. And again, our goal of classification is to put organisms, in this case plants, in groups that are closely related. So every member of each group is closely related to the other members, and each group is distantly related to the other groups. I mean, that's not especially well said. <laughs> um, yeah. What else would you like to know about these plants? The tree they came from, and what about the tree? That was one answer I see. Anything about that tree? Would anyone like to know about the flowers that these plants came from? And in fact, in um, classifying plants, um, usually the flowers are the first thing that people look at if they have a flower. The tree they came from, where are the trees commonly found? Yeah, that's a good answer too. Something about their environment, that would be helpful. Can you eat some of the flowers? Yeah, some flowers are edible. Um, that might help you in your classification scheme. Maybe where the, the trees are, like where they're usually, where they usually grow. Yeah. Because you talked about the one that retains a lot of water. Yeah. Like, you know, hotter, like less water. Yeah. Um, that would environment or habitat? Yeah. Um, you might want to know, is it a plant that grows and dies back to the ground every year? Like some of the, the vegetables and some of the flowers in people's yards. Um, some plants, they grow, and they become woody and they keep adding woody tissue year after year. Others grow and just for one season and then they produce a flower and then seeds and then they die. So those are the kinds of things that botanists would also consider when they're trying to come up with a classification system. Um, so we have uh, Hartley says how old the tree they come from is. So that's like, is it a relatively, yeah, like an older tree or a younger tree and also the growth of the leaf I would imagine. Is Sometimes on uh, a tree, the young leaves look very different from the old leaves. So that's something to consider as well. Uh, a lot of poplars, if you go outside and you see poplars growing, young poplars will have huge leaves. And then as the tree gets older, the leaves get smaller and smaller. So you, just observing that is really critical because if you only compared the size of the leaves, you might think they were from different trees or different species, but they're the same species. Um, so Ken, one thing I'm thinking, because we have about five minutes left, mm -hmm. and um, Anna, again from uh, Facebook, says uh, she and her son, they think that the top leaf on the left is a rose leaf. This one here? Possibly. But I'm thinking maybe um, over the next couple of minutes, 
if you want to just now that we categorize these, maybe mm -hmm. we just give a little like pull the, back the curtain a little bit in terms of what we're looking at and what are these leaves. Sure. So okay. is that true? Is that a rose leaf? There are no rose leaves here. This is an ash leaf. This is a bean, bean leaf. Uh, it's got three parts to it. This is a, a, a leaf from a locust tree. This is a type of geranium. Here's one of my favorite plants. This is from Saskatoon berry bush. Mm. What makes it one of your favorite plants? The berries. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I Fair love enough. berries. Okay, here's a plant. Um, you can see how fuzzy the leaf is. This might remind you of a part of an animal, the ear of a particular animal. So this is called lamb's ears. Is it so woolly? This is another kind of uh, hairy leaf. And I could have used, I could have put these two together in one group because they have hairy leaves. This plant is called woolly sunflower. It's called woolly because the underside of the leaf is very fuzzy. Um, what's the what's the form and function of that? Like why why would uh, it be underside? Does anyone have any ideas why a leaf might be fuzzy? So one of the challenges leaves have is not to lose too much moisture. And the hairs on the leaves kind of protect the leaf from losing moisture. And sometimes you'll start to learn about the little holes on the underside of the leaf called stomata. And that's where oxygen is released. As one of, the, one of you mentioned earlier, oxygen comes out of the plant leaves and carbon dioxide goes in. And carbon dioxide plus water is critical. And sun's energy is what makes photosynthesis go. And you're going to like this. The first product, the first thing in the photosynthetic reaction is sugar. And from that, it's, it's broken down and all other parts of the plant are, are uh, provided the nutrients they need from that sugar. So, so here one, of the, one, of the, one of the guesses, Ken, is why it's woolly is to stop it from being eaten. That is a great answer as well. And, and sometimes Hairs on leaves will have little glands and they'll have chemicals in those glands that animals learn not to like to eat. Mm. Yeah, okay. and this, this is a geranium leaf and you probably can't see it, but it is covered in little hairs that have glands and there's chemicals in those, in those glands that are, I don't think they smell very good. I definitely would not eat it. Right. <laughs> What, what would you eat here? What would I eat here? Uh, I would not eat any of these leaves. <laughs> you would, maybe the beans that are connected to the beans. I would eat the them. beans from here and I grow lots of dry beans. I'm vegetarian, so I try to grow as much protein as I can. Um, I would eat, I don't think I would eat the leaf, however, of the bean plant, but I would eat the leaves, um, the, 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 the bean seeds and the bean pod. I would definitely eat the berries from the Saskatoon plant. Um, the rest of these plants, I would not eat the leaves. It's a good thing to, just a reminder not to, yeah. just to eat whatever you see. But, and that's, that's part of knowing about plants is also knowing about what you can do with plants too. So, um, and uh, so uh, we're just finishing up now, there's a, uh, so a couple of comments again from Facebook with Anna, uh, sensory reasons and moisture. So maybe that's also connected with, I think the, the, um, the fur, possible furriness. And then Hartley says, me and my sister found some autumn crocus growing under a concrete slab. How did it start growing if it couldn't get sunlight? That is an excellent question. And it's, this kind of relates to classification and what else you might want to know about these plants is the autumn crocus is growing from a bulb. So it has energy stored in that bulb 
and that's how it's growing without sunlight. But it will need some leaves and some sunlight to put the energy back into the bulb so that it can grow next year. Uh -huh. And that's a, that's a great uh, way of classification as well as plants that produce bulbs, that grow from bulbs and plants that don't. And they, they took the slab off. That will make the crocus very happy because it, yeah. does, need, it does need to, to make some energy this fall in order to be able to store that in the bulb and grow again next year. Yeah, so it's nice that you did that, Hartley. Well, Ken, I don't know if you want to, um, if you can change your camera back. But if not, you could also come around the corner if you wanted to. Oh, there you are. Great. Here I am. Great. Yeah. Technology. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Ken, for, for joining us. And uh, I th that, that, that's a, a big part of your work, right, is to look at the things that are going, because you do a lot of field work as well. So you go out and you collect plant specimens that maybe yeah. are, so you try to figure out what's in what region of British Columbia and why they're growing and how are they growing. And then you bring some of those plant specimens back to the museum, and then you place those within a collection that's been cataloged and, and um, organized in such a way that it's easy to find and easy to understand. So the kind of work that you just did now, it seems like that's a big part of your, your work is to understand the difference between different plants. Is that true? Yeah, yep, and, and you mentioned putting them in the plant collection and we have to have a way of classifying them. We have 220,000 specimens. So uh, if I want to go find a particular specimen, I have, there has to be a way I can find it easily. So it's kind of like a library. Um, they're all organized according to a, a system of classification. And I think Chris, you've come to the herbarium before and I ask people, I was gonna give me the name of a plant and I'll find it. Tell me your favorite plant and I'll find a specimen in less than a minute. And I can usually do it, but only because they're organized according to a system of logical classification. I have been there with a stopwatch and I've seen that happen. <laughs> it's quite amazing. So everyone out there on Facebook Live and uh, the Zoom room, next time we're able to allow people into the collection area, um, definitely come join us and see the magic of Ken Marr. Um, the botanist here at the Royal BC Museum. So thank you so much, Ken, for, for joining us um, in the work that you do here. Um, and thanks everyone on Facebook Live and, and the Zoom room for joining us. Uh, we're continuing, school is starting next week. So we'll, we'll have a little, um, or school starting this week, but we'll, next week we'll have a little session on school and learning. Uh, so even if you are in school, Join us on uh, later with our YouTube um, video if you want, if you'd like, or also have your teacher, um, have everyone watch at this time. So that has happened sometimes as well. And, um, and yeah, and if you want to come join us at the museum, we are open, um, but it's time ticketing. So you just need to get a time ticket uh, from the website and then uh, the whole museum is now open. So. Um, just for a small, smaller number of people than usual. So again, thanks so much. Uh, great to see everyone and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right.